can I, can I tell you something? You know, even God prepared for the birth of Jesus before it came about. If you remember, um, we have been talking about um, a promise, the promise. And, and one of the things that God has done is this. If you go through the Bible, he has given us promise after promise after promise, right? And, and, and I gotta ask you a question. How many of those promises has he ever broken? Uh, can anybody find one promise that, that God has ever broken? Okay, then, then, then why is it that we don't believe some of them? That we have a hard time. For instance, you get into a hard situation and it seems like your whole world is just crushing around about you. And I'm not asking you to lift up your hands or, or pinpoint you out or anything else, but have you ever got into a situation where the first thing you said was, God, where are you? If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And, and, and I'm sorry, but I think he gave us a promise that I will be with you always. Right? But sometimes we get wrapped up in the moments with the pain and the hurt. And sometimes we forget That love comes with pain. It isn't always happiness. There's a new, newspaper article that has been going around, I, I've seen it now for the last week or so, of a couple in, Hamil or in Butler County. I think Hamilton, but I, I think it's Butler County. They had been married 79 years. And they died within 20 minutes of each other. Do you think about it? Someone that's been married for 79 years and all of a sudden their loved one dies. Everybody knows how painful that is, right? Even, even if uh, babies that are just born or not born, the pain just from a moment that you haven't shared in 79 years with, but the pain of that, losing that one after 79 years, that kind of would break your heart and probably zap some of your desire to live out. Was, someone was sharing with me, they had purchased a house from a lady, an elderly lady, that unfortunately the laws of our land sometimes are, are messed up. That when a, a, an individual has to go into a, um, we used to call them nursing homes, but they're assisted living places and everything else. If you had any property, any money, you had to spend all of that money up to, I think you were allowed to have maybe one or $2,000 left. We had to do it with my mom's house. We had to sell it. So this lady was getting to the point of her life that she was going to have to go into an assisted living place because nobody wanted to take care of her anymore. And so she was selling her house and getting prepared. She sold her house to someone and she was moving out. She went to the garage, put 
put the garage door down and turned on the car because she felt she had nothing else to do. I've lived for such a long time and I don't want to give it all up. And you look at all of that and you think, wow, is this what we're coming to? But I've got something for you. And God has said, I I promise us that he's given us. And this is what we've been going into is promise. The very first week we were talking about the, the greatest thing that God has given us is how to love. Because let me say, tell you something. If you don't know how to love, then you're not going to understand life. Your life is going to be miserable. Now, love doesn't mean that it's not going to hurt. Love does hurt. And don't let anybody tell you not. Yes, there are joyous times, but there's also pain in love. Why? Because in love, you've got to give part of yourself to someone else. And sometimes they're receptive in giving it back, or sometimes they're receptive in just sucking it out of you and draining you. And sometimes that hurts. But the one thing that God has shown us is just exactly what love is all about. And that's what he does, or did, and has done and continues to do. And so, go back for a moment and remember when you got the news that you were pregnant. Some of you probably said, you have got to be kidding me. This was not the best of times for this to have happened. I am not prepared for this. I've got all of these other things that I needed to do before I had children. And then all of a sudden a child comes along and your whole life is just turned upside down. Or others, you actually had it kind of mapped out and prepared. But either way, you knew that roughly in about nine months, your life was going to change. You had no idea how much, but it was going to change. And so you started having to prepare for that. One of the things that you did was you slept all the time because you knew as soon as that baby came, You can forget night nights. In the middle of the night, that baby is going to get hungry and wind up. That baby wants to be held. And can I tell you something? That even in the preparation, even in the coming of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, God was making preparations for his birth. And that's what we're going to talk about today is about joy because God was trying to show us that even in the birth of his son, he was making preparations for some things to happen of people around him and how their lives were going to be affected. And so when we discovered some of the promises, we talked about the love. Uh, Last week we talked about the peace, remember? He came to the shepherds in the fields and what did they say? We, the angels told them, peace on, we're bringing you peace on earth. The peace on earth is not treaties. The peace on earth is now a reconciliation between God and man. Now we can go to God and talk to him and experience his love through his son, Jesus Christ, which brought truce to us and made peace with us. And so when we discovered all of those, we've also discovered this. I don't know about you, but Christmas is really one of the most favorite times of the year. I, I, you know, even with all of the crowds, I, I, I won't go shopping on, on Good Friday, or on Good Friday, Black Friday, because there's nothing good about that Black Friday, Okay. But I don't know about you, but I love everything about Christmas. 
I get to see people that I haven't seen in a while, even in church, love it. Because there are people that maybe, you know, and I'm not knocking anybody, please don't get this wrong, but some people, they don't go to church all year, but they'll come at Christmas time and, and, and Easter. But now those two have been overshadowed by Mother's Day. Do you know that Mother's Day is the number one attended church service above Christmas and Easter now? People will tick off God, but they don't want to tick off their mother. Right? I mean, it's just that simple. You, you know, a lot of times you can tell God no, but if mom asks you something, you don't want to feel the wrath of mom. But anyway, that's another subject for another day. But I don't know about you, I love eating at Christmas time. Not necessarily the meals. I have to take more sugar medicine. <laughs> because I, I, I do. I, I love chocolates. Chocolates is, 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 chocolates, it's a health food. Okay? If you, if you really look at chocolate, it will give you all of your basic feel, uh, food groups. It's just a little bit too much of one over the other, Okay? It's not skim milk or, or fat-free. It's, it's, it's a full force with additives. Um, I love giving gifts. Okay? Everybody asks me, and, 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 and I'm terrible. I understand this, okay? I, I really am, and I, and I apologize. Because every one of us love giving gifts, Right? And the reason that we love giving gifts is we love to see the smile on the person's face when they get it. Even if this is the worst thing in the world, they will still tell you that they love it, right? Okay? Be because it, it brings joy to you. And, and I'm terrible because everybody asks me, what, do you, what can I give you for Christmas? And you know what I've started telling people? Just give me time. Because I can go out and buy everything else. But what I can't purchase is time from you. And so if you really want to, if you really want to make me happy, give me your time. Um, not all of you. <laughs> I'll write you a letter who I wanted to have time with. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Please, don't take me serious. Take me serious on some things, okay? But honestly, I, I, and I do, the, the joy of Christmas, just watching the faces of little kids and, and just the excitement, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It, it really, it really, it really is. And, and, and just that joy, you, you know, that's there. And, and sometimes... Can I tell you, I'm not the most patient person in the world at Christmas time. We we have we ha we have this um, tradition. I call it habit tradition that we do. Okay, at our house, uh, all of our kids come over Christmas Eve, as many as as all the times the kids do. Sometimes some of the grandkids don't, aren't making it, they're working or they're out of town. Or this, or, but we have all of the kids, the whole idea is have the kids, grandkids, and everybody all come over. And we do our family exchange together. Now, we do not do a, a free-for-all gift opening session. What we do is, Diana is very organized. Okay, and so, so every year, she's got this list of everybody in the family. So if you've married into the family, you go on the list, okay? And she's got an order in which they all go. And so what happens is somebody, whoever it was last year, got to pick first. 
the next person gets to pick first on, on the list that she has, okay? So that person goes over, gets a gift out of this big pile of gifts that are all there, and gives it to the person. And they read who it, the gift is from. And so that person opens a gift and then has to give a hug or a kiss to the person and tell the person thank you for the gift. So please understand, we have, I don't know how many adults. <laughs> yes, we have probably about 30 with a, at least five to six gifts or more a piece. So this becomes an all-night thing, okay? Why? Because we don't, at Christmas morning, we exchange our, our own gifts, uh, you know, if we don't do it on Christmas Eve, but we sleep in, okay? And then we get up and, and we go eat dinner somewhere or we, or we, or we just grab bologna sandwiches, huh? Or yes, we always go to a movie on Christmas Day. And, and so that's our time, our time together to, to celebrate, okay? And, and so I'm not a patient person sometimes because it's like I bought a special gift for someone and I want to see them open it and nobody has picked it out yet. And so it's my turn. And you're not supposed to pick your own gift out. You have to pick someone else's. But sometimes I got to break the tradition and get that gift that I bought that I want to give to that person because I'm tired of sitting around and not, not getting it. So I got to go gift that gift and give it to them because I, I want to see the smile. I want, to, I want to see the reaction. I don't want it to be the last gift in the pile and they've gone through seven hours of opening gifts and they get this gift that you thought they would be excited about, and they get the gift and think, oh, well, thank you, Peppa. <laughs> really? I'll, how about if I take it back and I'll give it to you first next Christmas? <laughs> you know? And, and so this is how we, how we do things. But I, I got to tell you something. That when we begin to see Christmas, it's really hard to keep the joy of Christmas to yourself. I've already, I've already messed with people out and about, shopping. They are so frustrated and they're, they're so angry and their, their, their face is so distorted. And I'll look at them and I'll say, hey, how's it going? Would you not talk to me, dude? Hey, it's wonderful time, man. It's not snowing yet, right? But I think this Christmas we just might get it. I don't like snow. Then why are you in Ohio? You know, if you don't like snow, go to Arizona or someplace, you know? But anyway, you're, you're here. And, and so let's just talk about how great Christmas is because in Christmas there really is joy and can I tell you something when someone really finds joy it's hard for them to hide it now some of you I know you're still trying to find it okay but can I tell you it's really out there turn off the news Okay, because in the newspapers, there is no joy. Well, there's, there's some, but don't read the headlines, okay? Just go straight to the, no, don't even go to the funny pages anymore because they're too political. So what you need to do, oh, I know what you can do. Read the Bible. That's cool. Just open it up and you'll, you'll find some things in there that, that would be really interesting, but one of the things that we can find is that joy, we can't keep it to ourselves. We've got to tell people all about it. And so when, when we began to look at the Christmas story, okay, and I'm not going to argue about when Christmas is, okay? I, I, I'm not one of those 
hard-lying religious people that says Christmas didn't happen on December the 25th. It probably didn't. It may have been the 24th, <laughs> you know, I, or it may have been June. I don't care. All I know is Jesus was born on a day. Not 365, it, there was a day. So let's pick it out and let's celebrate it. But in reality, I like to celebrate it every, every day, but I can't do that. But I do in my, in my own way. And, and so what happens is this. If I've got the greatest gift that was ever given to me, and I find joy in that gift, how hard is it for me to te- not tell people about it? Right? Then why is it we have a, find it a hard time to tell people about Jesus? Can I tell you why? Because we don't find joy in it. We've allowed the world to crowd out our joy. We're mad at the politicians. We're mad at inflation. We're mad at the price of eggs. We, we, were, we were at a birthday party with RJ yesterday and, and, and there was a, a lady and we were, we were talking to her and um, her husband is, is a farmer. He's got like a, she said, I don't even know how many acres he's got that he, that he farms and they've got some uh, cattle and stuff but they also bought chickens. And they said, yeah, because you want to know why? Eggs used to be 69 cents a dozen. Now they're $4 and something a dozen. And she said, you know how many dozen eggs I can get every day from chickens? That's $5 that I'm saving. All I got to do is just feed them a little bit, and they're going to lay the eggs all the time for me. And, and then this other lady says, well, can I buy some chickens and bring them over to your house and you get the eggs for me and I'll, I'll pick them up every day? <laughs> because where I live, I can't raise chickens, you, you know? And I thought, that's not a bad idea. I wonder if we can do share farming with chickens, you, you know? And then we start talking about the beef and all of the other stuff and, and, and whether they did all of these things. But one of the greatest parts of, of, of this whole story, and, and we'll, we'll talk about We'll talk about it. It is one of one of the people that had the greatest joy in, in the birth of, of Christ. But let's start. Um, let's go to Isaiah chapter forty, verses three through five, and I think I've got all of these up. Okay, because one of the things that we want to know is, is this: the greatest gift that was ever given to humankind was not the computer, was not the the. The, uh, was not the, uh, uh, you know, gas-powered engines. It, it was not all of the knowledge and everything else that we've got and the vaccinations and all of these other things. The greatest gift that was ever given to humankind was Jesus, given by the greatest gift giver of God, the Father. And, and so um, can I tell you something? That Jesus is better than sliced bread Uh, I, I mean, you may, you may really like your peanut butter sandwich or your fried bologna or whatever, you know, good sandwiches, but Jesus is better than that. And, and, and really, really, really good uh, for you, uh, very nutritious. Um, I, and for those of you that like the pumpkin, pumpkin spice lattes right now at this time of the year, he's better than that. I, I know... I know some of you really find this very difficult, and, and I'm busting your bubble today, but I got to tell you something. I have found something better than what you could ever find, and his name is Jesus, the best gift. So let's start unwrapping this. If I want to find joy, there's a lot of ways that we can find joy, but the problem is this. A lot of the things that I think brings me true joy lets me down. For instance, some of you got married and you thought in that marriage, this is it. That, you know, marriage is supposed to really be joyful. 
and about three days later, you have your first argument. What time today do you want to go home to your mother? I think your mom and dad should deal with your attitude right now, not me. Uh, That's the wife talking to the husband, not the husband talking to the wife. (laughs) We haven't got any kids yet, but you're sure acting like kids. I didn't marry you to raise you, right? So would you please pick up your clothes? I'm not your mom. And all of a sudden, the joy of this luster has kind of just faded away. Or there becomes bigger arguments, more disappointments. You have a child. And you think that's going to bring you joy. Then all of a sudden something happens. And there's all of these things. They're not bad things. But in all of these things, we don't always have true joy. There's heartaches that are in there. And sometimes things don't go the way we planned. But the truth the source of true joy is found in Jesus, okay? In Isaiah chapter um, 40, verses 3 through 5, says this. It says, a voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up Every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord, he said, has spoken. So the book of Isaiah talks about the prophetic coming of, of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But when you look at this, word was given about someone who was going to come before Christ that was going to prepare the people, begin to speak to the people about the one who's coming after him. saying there's somebody coming before him. And this someone that's coming before him is going to prepare the way for him. So that when he talks about it, it's going to be in the deserts. When he talks about it, it's going to be in every place else. And what he's trying to say is this, that in so many ways, everybody was looking for a way for the Messiah to come. And everybody was looking for a way to come to the Messiah. And what God was saying is this, there is going to be one that is going to come and prepare the way. And what he's going to do is he's going to show you that the path to Jesus is not a windy curve. It's a straight line. What he's going to say to you is that those of those that that think you can find him in the mountains and in the valleys and all of these things that you need to understand that it's going to we're going to level this out and no matter where you're at no matter what you're doing you're going to be able to find this messiah so that everybody has an equal chance and an equal opportunity to find him It doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are, how sick or how healthy. It doesn't matter if you've got a house or no house, car, no car. It doesn't matter if you're five or 105. It's a level playing field for everyone. Nobody's different. 
They're all the same. And so a lot of times, for some of you, the day after Thanksgiving, you start preparing for Christmas. You start rearranging the furniture. The wife tells the husband, go get all the containers that's got all the Christmas decorations and we'll start putting it out. And you start decorating everything in anticipation for that day and that preparation of what's going on. And what Jesus is trying to help us to understand is this. Everybody in the world needs to understand the story of Jesus. And we've got, we, as believers, we've got to prepare these people for this. Can, can, I, can I tell you something? Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that? I, I, seriously, do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Okay, then let me ask you this question. How many people do you know that are not prepared for him to come? If we really are serious about him coming, then shouldn't we be serious about helping those people get prepared for his coming? Why not? We are. Right? Right? But we don't. We say we're serious, but our actions don't back up our words. Every day, every Sunday, churches are going to be packed. People are going to be told. But how many, how many churches are they being told that Jesus is coming? A lot of the messages anymore is not about Jesus coming. It's about way of life. It's about this or make you feel good. Yeah, Jesus makes you feel good. Understand that. But he also convicts us of things that we need to do. And and so what Jesus, what God was telling them and Isaiah was this. Jesus is coming and you need to get prepared because I'm preparing the place. Can I tell you something? God has given us a promise that Jesus is coming again. I don't know where he's going to show up. I don't know, well, I do know where he's going to show up. He's going to show up everywhere. But I don't know when he's going to do it. And so my task and your task is to get people ready for this. Right? We're we're ready, I hope. I hope you are this morning. I hope you're ready for it. Because it may be today. And, And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be caught off guard. So, in the Bible... In the book of Luke, where it begins to start telling about the life of Jesus, it tells about another character that sometimes we really don't relate to Christmas. But this person, this person was very important in the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 17, There was a gentleman by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest serving in the temple. He was married to a lady by the name of Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth are are old. They're, They're like an Abraham and a Sarah of the Old Testament but they are the Abraham and Sarah of the new. 
Zechariah is in the temple serving in his capacity as a priest. He's been in there many, many times. He's going through all about his duties and thinking that today is just going to be another day. It's almost like a habit that he could probably do all of his duties and not really think much about it until this day is different. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense, a very sacred spot in the temple where they're offering up the sacrifices. And in preparation, he's doing all of this. And when Zechariah saw him, he was what? Terrified and overcome with fear. I don't know about y'all, but if I came in here for church on Sunday morning, the lights are out and nobody's around, and I come in the sanctuary and I see an angel standing up here, I'm going to be terrified and full of fear. And you would say, well, you're the pastor. Yeah, and I'm showing a shining example because you're probably going to be afraid too. This is not something you truly expect, right? So he's going in there, and he's not expecting this image to show up. And he was terrified and overcome with fear. Now look at, look at what the angel said in verse number 13. But the angel said unto him, what? Do not be afraid. Isn't it amaz- amazing? The greeting of angels is always, do not be afraid. <laughs> That's their greeting. Why? They know us very well. They've done this a lot of times. And they know how, mo- how everybody seems to react. This is, this is typical. So do not be afraid, Zachariah, because what? Your prayer has been heard. Zechariah and Elizabeth had prayed for children and never had any and thought, God, you didn't answer that prayer. But God answered that prayer in his time and at his moment. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear your son By the way, you can't pick out the name. I'm going to name him for you. And you will name him John. 14, there will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. When we read this, a lot of times we think, oh, yeah, well, when a child is born... Yeah, there's always rejoicing. No, we're not just talking about when he's born now. We're talking about 30 years later. There's going to be people rejoicing at his birth because there's something that he's going to do. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Here's what he's not allowed to do. He's not allowed to drink wine or beer. Or uh, in some of yours, it'll have fermented beverages. Beer is a fermented beverage. That's how they get all of the the yeast and the stuff and and the alcoholic content in there and everything to help provide that, okay? Drink wine or beer. That's the new version. They didn't have beer back then. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in the mother's womb. Whoa. And you just thought that was your baby kicking. How would you like to be Elizabeth? Typical. I've never been pregnant before, and all of a sudden this baby's kicking. What is that? You think about the kicking that she's feeling. 
John is, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Elizabeth is six months old. And she, six months pregnant, yeah. <laughs> there was six months and something. She was six months pregnant, okay? She, she's in her 90s. How would you like to be 96 months pregnant? <laughs> Not only is she old and pregnant, all of a sudden she comes in the presence of her cousin, Mary, who is just, just, just now pregnant. She's not six months. I don't know if she's six days. She just barely con conceived. And all of a sudden, she comes into the presence of Elizabeth, and John is throwing a Holy Ghost fit. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, if you were there, you probably saw her belly just going like a this. Because when you, come in, when you come into the presence of God and the Holy Spirit's there, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to boogie. And I'll guarantee you that John was doing some dancing in there. Because the Bible says that the, all of a sudden the baby just began to leap. Why? Because he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. And just a little child. So when does life start? At conception. Because John was there. So look at what he says. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. Here, here is the priest, and he's being told, man, I'm running behind. I've got to get moving, or else, or else you're here till 2. We'll, we'll fix your lunch. Okay, but anyway, children of Israel, Lord to God, and look at 17. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. There we go to turn the hearts of the father to the children, the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous, to make ready for the, lot, the Lord a prepared place. He, he's going to have the power of Elijah. What, what did Elijah do? Yeah. He, stopped, he stopped it from raining for three and a half years. What else did he do? He called down fire from heaven. He killed the, prop, he, the prophets of Baal, all fell, right? I mean, this dude had some power, and John's going to have that same power to be able to proclaim to people what's going on. And so what we need to understand is you've got to understand something. Zachariah's old, Elizabeth old, and he's telling them, this, this little child is going to be a joy to you. And they're probably thinking, are you nuts? I don't know about you all. I love my grandchildren. But I also love to send them home. Okay? I, I can't handle seven days of them like I would have a child. Okay? But, yeah, children are a joy. And then they bring it to the parents, and here it is. They're old, and all of a sudden, man, they've got to have some kind of energy to hold on to, hold on to this guy, this kid, because this isn't just a regular child. This is a special child, and he's going to prepare the way for Jesus. And so, so think about it. How much joy that child brought to those two parents. And they haven't even met Jesus yet, but they're going to. They're going to meet him soon in a, in a few months, okay? Point number two it is what we have forgotten is this. It is joy in knowing Jesus. But can I tell you something? It's equally as much joy to help other people learn the experience 
of the joy of meeting Jesus. I don't know about you, but I get excited when I'm talking to someone who doesn't know Jesus and they come to know the Lord. That, ladies and gentlemen, is exciting because all of a sudden you watch the excitement's building in there as they begin to start experiencing what you're experiencing. Have you ever, have you ever had something happen to you and I mean, it really, really excited you. And you tried to tell that experience to someone else, and they look at you like, really? What's so exciting about that? And you know how much that deflates you? Man, or you're married. And something exciting happened. And you go home and you tell your husband or your wife and they look at you like, so? You want to hear about my day? No, I really don't. I want you to be excited about mine. You know? And it's like, oh, you know, this happened and that happened. And it's like, okay, Lord, that really sucked the energy out of that one. But it is exciting that when you're sitting there and you're watching someone and, and you've been talking to them about Jesus and all of a sudden they grasp it. And all of a sudden they start asking questions. And all of a sudden you get to lead them to the Lord. And this is like, wow, this is, happening. This is awesome. And the things that we need to understand. There was a, a, a man who wrote a story and it was about his mother, and he wrote this story, and he called it Misery Dinner, okay? And it was a night, it was a night after, he, he, in the story, it goes like this. It was a night after his father came home and said it looked as if he would have to go into bankruptcy because his partner had, had basically squandered away all of the firm's funds. Well, his mother went out and sold some jewelry to buy to buy some food for a sumptuous feast. And then other members of the family, they scolded her for it. But she told them, the time, of jo- the time for joy is now, when we need it the most. Not next week, but right now. He, writes, he goes on to write, her courageous act rallied the family. Her sacrifice instilled a newfound joy in the downtrodden. By the mother giving up what she valued, her family ate together and found strength from one another to never give up. Sometimes in all of these things, we find joy in something. And all of a sudden in that joy we find, we find not giving up. And that's the joy of finding Christ. And let me finish. Oh, yeah. Let me finish with this, okay? Uh, go down, if, if you would, uh, to Luke, uh, the next one, Luke 1, 18 and 20, and then we'll, we'll skip the other one. He says, how can I know this, Zacharias says. Zacharias asked the angel, for I'm an old man and my wife is well among, well among in years. And the, ans- the angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Uh, Go on, uh, verse number 20. Can you give it to me real quick? Uh, Next verse. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which were fulfilled in their proper time. How would you like to be about Zechariah? You were told you were gonna have a baby, you're old, and all of a sudden you can't tell anybody. I mean, yeah, you got it right. But you can't tell anybody about this. Because why? He didn't believe. Didn't believe it was going to happen to him. And so all of a sudden, the joy is just stripped out. And he's got to wait. And guess what? So what's he doing? 
Now he's finding a new joy in the anticipation of the birth of his son. Because as soon as his son's born, he gets to speak again. How would you like to be shut up for nine months? Now, some of you husband, maybe you want to pray to God, you know, or some of you husbands, maybe pray to God for your wives or for your kids or whatever. Or better yet, pray to God that some of these newscasters would go, <laughs> could not speak for nine months. That would be awesome. But can I tell you something about John? John's name in the Greek means graced by God. Or other words, Jehovah has been gracious. Jehovah has been gracious. gracious. Yeah. We, we know about John's name in, in the Hebrew or Joshua or, or Savior. But in the Greek, it means that Jehovah, Jehovah is. And so what, what do we understand? We understand this. And here's what John understood. He, he understands that joy comes from the grace of God. And that's where we need to understand that our joy comes from. Our joy doesn't come from something that we really can hold. I can't hold in my hands the grace of God. But I can sure experience it in my being. And in this container that holds God, where God resides and God lives, I can experience the grace. You see, what, what we want is we want the joy on the outside. Can I tell you something? When you get joy coming from the inside, it overshadows the outside. And it takes a, a lot of bombardment Even on the outside, let, let me uh, can you play real quick, if you will. And let me finish with this. How many of you all are Christians? Hmm? You Christian? Okay. So I'm talking to everybody in here that's a Christian. How many of you get attacked by Satan? How many of you all get attacked by Satan? If you don't, I need to talk to you. Because <laughs> something ain't right. Okay. How many of you get upset when he does it? Hmm? How many of you all get ups upset when Satan attacks you? How many of you all have ever said, why me, Lord? Right? Why me, Lord? So what's happened? Our joy has been zapped, right? It should never be. It should never be. Can I tell you something? In those times when all of this is happening, we should have more joy. Paul says this. I count it a privilege to suffer with Christ. What did Satan try to do to Jesus? From the moment, from the moment that he found out that Jesus was going to be born, he was on a mission to stop it. And when he was born, Satan was on a mission to stop him from going to the cross. And when Jesus went to the cross, Satan was on a mission for him not to rise again. Right? His mission had always been to stop 
Jesus from doing what God had called him to do. And so Satan, ladies and gentlemen, is trying to stop you from doing what it is that God wants you to do. And so when it happens, you know what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God, because that means I'm serving you. I'm making Satan angry because if he's happy with you, there's something wrong. But Zechariah, Zechariah found joy even in all of the stuff that was going on. He found joy. My question to you is this. As we get closer and closer of the time that we celebrate as Christmas, as the greatest gift that God has ever given, my question to you is this. You can experience that gift from afar. You've asked, you've asked for something, okay? And so you know that that person has bought that gift for you and now they have it wrapped under the Christmas tree. And every day you look at that present thinking that, I, that on Christmas Day I'm going to get the joy of opening that of what it is that I've been wanting and wanting and wanting and finally I'm going to be able to get it. And guess what happens? On Christmas Day, you open that gift and it's not the gift that you thought. They bought you something else. And all of a sudden, your joy is gone. If they would have just let me open it up before now, I wouldn't have had all of this. But the great thing about, about God and Jesus is, I don't have to wait for Jesus to come back to unwrap him and to feel the joy of his coming. I've already unwrapped him. Every day, every day he's here. And my question to you is this. If you don't feel the joy of his salvation, you, something wrong. There's something wrong. Because the salvation that Jesus, God has given us, ladies and gentlemen, is enough to conquer everything. David said, I got everything I need. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't want anything. There's a lot of things I need. And guess what? I don't need anything because God said he'd provide it. And I don't know about you. If God's providing my needs, what else do I want? Because he can provide everything. I don't want everything. I just want him to love me. And by loving me, he'll, he'll find, he knows what I need. And that's what he'll provide. If you don't have that, you need to, you need to come back today and reconnect. Because something's wrong with the connection here.